Welcome colleagues and friends to the Psychological Humanities and Ethics Lecture Series, where we hope to think a little bit more humanely and practice a little bit more ethically as we face others. I'm Muki Manalili, and I'll be your host tonight with our special guest, Dr. Leanne Young. Thanks for joining us tonight, Leanne. Thanks, Muki. It's nice to be here. Yeah. Um, a brief introduction uh, for Leanne. She is an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at Boston College and director of the Morality Lab. She received her BA in philosophy and PhD in psychology from Harvard before doing postdoctoral research at MIT in the brain and cognitive sciences department. Her lab investigates human moral psychology using tools of social psychology and neuroscience like functional magnetic resonance imaging. Her recent projects focus on how people engage in reasoning for moral thought and action, how people think and learn about others across a social relational context, and how people apply principles of obligation and impartiality. Leanne's work has received widespread acclaim and support. Sorry to put you on the spot, uh, including uh, the Stanton and William James Prizes for the Society of Philosophy and Psychology. Her lab's work has been published in academic journals such as the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences and Psychological Sciences and news outlets such as New York Times. To learn more, feel free to visit Morality Lab at .beasts.edu. Additionally, on a more personal note, uh, as a psychotherapist hoping to pursue further research in philosophical psychology, Leanne has been a very thoughtfully brilliant and inspiring mentor in the moral psychology field. Uh, Leanne, would you mind briefly sharing a little bit with the audience of what personally interested you in this field? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Muki, for that introduction. So um, as Muki mentioned, I majored in philosophy as an undergrad. And the reason why was that I was really interested in um, how people solve moral dilemmas and why it is that we can have um, very confident intuitions um, about moral problems and yet disagree with people around us, including close others. And so um, I ended up majoring in philosophy to be able to understand better how it is that philosophers come up with solutions to moral dilemmas and um, how they're able to organize um, intuitions about moral cases. Um, you know, when and why is it permissible to harm one to save many? Um, and what are the principles that underlie our intuitions about these kinds of cases um, in, in moral scenarios and dilemmas in particular. So, um, so my interest in psychology um, really came from um, those questions in philosophy. Um, and then I mm. became very interested in uh, the role of uh, intentions in, in moral intuitions and moral judgments. Um, when intentions matter um, for moral judgments, um, how intentions make the difference between murder and manslaughter, for instance, um, other cases in which um, intentions seem to matter less. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about um, how more generally we think about other people's minds and how those processes play into our moral psychology. Thanks so much, Leanne. Yeah, I, I know that uh, Leanne will be sharing with us, you know, the wide breadth of, of the research. Uh, and yeah, in this particular lecture, Dr. Leanne will be discussing, as she noted, the field of moral psychology, aspects of theory of mind, and reasoning and moral judgments informed by social context. Uh, in another place, she noted that, you know, what makes morality unique uh, is the experience of moral judgment as a flash of intuition or a feeling of good versus bad. But underneath, these kind of feelings are complex psychological structures. And you know, I think even if my work with patients and other people as they kind of sort through their lived experiences. Yeah, she notes as social creatures, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, mental lives of those around us. You know, why did a person do this? Or why is my kid crying at this moment right now? Um, yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's great. Um, but yes, uh, so Leanne will explore these broad questions and also in very focused and very insightful research on how social context might shape these processes uh, from a social neuroscience perspective. For those in the audience, if you have any questions at all, feel free to post them 
in the question and answer. And Leanne noted that she'd be happy to take it uh, in between uh, the slides. And of course, we'll have a more dialogical uh, space in the end as well. But without further ado, Leanne. All right, thank you, Muki. And yeah, I, I don't know um, whether I'll be able to track the Q&A once I start my screen share, but um, Muki, I think we'll be um, keeping an eye out for people's questions and I'm happy to pause at any point to answer uh, questions as we go along. All right, so let me start the screen share. Okay. There they are. <laughs> All right, can everyone see my screen? Muki, mm -hmm. can you see that? All right. Yes. All right, so um, yeah, again, Muki, think, thanks for the introduction. Um, I can't see anyone's faces, unfortunately. I saw a few familiar names filter in through the participant list, which was nice. Um, so I hope that we can have a little bit of a dialogue as Muki mentioned through the uh, Q&A throughout and at the end. Um, but I'm really uh, happy to be here with uh, all of you. Um, as Muki mentioned, um, the work that I'll present today um, focuses on what our lab um, explores uh, within the domain of moral psychology. What I'll present is some of our lab's newer work. Much of it is still in progress. So I'll be excited to hear um, folks' feedback on, on the work. Um, at the broadest level of the talk today, we'll focus on how uh, social conduct shapes social cognition, how we think about other people, how we think about their mental lives, um, depending on who they are and our uh, relationship to them. Um, and we can catch this intuition that social context determines how we think about um, and learn about others in many instances. Um, so this is an example from um, my own experiences in academia. Uh, when we get feedback on our work, uh, the source matters. Um, so what I mean by that is whether the constructive criticism comes from a friendly colleague or an antagonistic reviewer uh, influences how we interpret that feedback um, and how we consider the underlying uh, intentions and motives of the critic. So in the talk today, um, we'll look specifically at how social context uh, influences this process by which we think about uh, mental states. And I will refer to this process as mentalizing or uh, theory of mind. Um, and so uh, Leanne, is it always reviewer two that gives the critical feedback? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> that, is the, that is the rule. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, at least reviewer two, sometimes more That's than right. reviewer two. Yeah. Mm. Um, so some of the questions that I want to explore today um, are the following. So do we focus more of our attention on the minds of those we trust and respect, um, our friends and colleagues, uh, or those we feel we're at odds with? Uh, do we think mm -hmm. about these different minds in different ways? How do we tell them apart? Um, and can answering these questions tell us about uh, some of the key features of mental state representation? Um, and then there are also instances in which um, the people around us, friends, colleagues, and as Muki mentioned, reviewer too, uh, may surprise us acting in ways that are uh, maybe inconsistent with our impressions of them. Um, and again, who these people are and the strength and valence of our prior impressions uh, matter. So if you hear a report um, of a close friend uh, versus a stranger taking money from a tip jar, you might uh, discount or try to explain away that new bit of information. Maybe your friend was making change for a dollar. Um, and so when and how do we update our representations of other minds? How does theory of mind support uh, impression updating? Um, and then finally, the context for other people's actions also matters for our evaluations of their actions. How do we judge um, a good Samaritan who helps a stranger versus someone who helps their friend or family member? So in the first part of the talk, we'll look at how people uh, deploy theory of mind across social and moral contexts. Um, we'll look at how people think about competitive versus cooperative partners and agents um, with harmful or helpful intentions. In the second part of the talk, we'll look at how people um, uh, how people update their judgments of others across context, harmful and helpful agents, uh, strangers and friends. We'll consider the uh, underlying mechanisms and also the consequences of asymmetric and maybe biased updating across contexts. And then finally, we'll turn to how people uh, judge other people who favor close versus distant others, mm -hmm. uh, kin versus strangers and, and vice versa. So first, how do people think about the thoughts of others across competitive and cooperative contexts? So fortunately, there's already quite a lot of relevant literature uh, here. Um, first, extensive research on outgroup uh, dehumanization suggests that 
theory of mind may be deployed to a lesser extent during competition than uh, cooperation. So people attribute less mind to outgroup versus in-group members. Um, for instance, viewing pictures of extreme outgroup members elicits uh, reduced activation in brain regions for social cognition, um, like the medial prefrontal cortex or, or MPFC right there. Mm -hmm. um, and on the flip side, the more people like and want to affiliate with an individual, the more mind um, they will attribute to that individual. Mm -hmm. A different um, prediction is enhanced theory of mind um, for competition versus cooperation. Um, and here, work on the evolutionary origins of uh, theory of mind reveals that rudimentary theory of mind capacities in non-human primates are driven by the need to uh, outcompete conspecifics over scarce resources like food. Um, and adult behavioral work also shows um, that theory of mind is especially triggered um, by the need to understand agents' bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, a third prediction is that theory of mind is robustly engaged for both uh, cooperation and competition, um, mm -hmm. including the need for strategic understanding and also the need for social um, connection. So people may be motivated to uh, predict others' actions to outsmart enemies and plan attacks, um, but people are also motivated to um, understand others to create, maintain alliances. Um, and some work that my colleague uh, Adam Waits and I have done suggests mm -hmm. that people might focus on uh, different components of mental states depending on um, their motivational context or perspective. So for predicting someone's action, it's really important to understand their mm -hmm. agentive mental states. Um, but for um, affiliation or social connection, it's more important to under understand somebody's experience. Um, and other work that um, Adam and I have done with our colleague Jeremy Gingis um, shows um, certain biases and how people mm. attribute motives across group boundaries um, to in-groups versus out-groups. Um, and so based on this work, we hypothesize that theory, mind, and, and mental state inference would be uh, mm -hmm. robustly deployed across both uh, cooperation and competition. And again, for some of our, our clinical friends, Leanne, uh, the TOM in theory of mind, what would be a good succinct way to put, put that in maybe uh, what kind of regions does it recruit, particularly the, the RTPJ? Yeah, I'm about to get to this on this slide. That's so fantastic. We'll in just a moment. Yeah, so um, to talk about hypothesis about um, uh, theory of mind um, across these different social contexts, we looked at as mm -hmm. we anticipated brain regions that support this uh, set of cognitive processes. So typically we use um, what's called a functional localizer test to identify these brain mm -hmm. regions of interest or ROIs um, for this cognitive capacity um, within individual participants. And the task that we use um, contrasts uh, 10 stories describing mental states like false beliefs uh, with 10 stories describing physical states like outdated um, maps or photographs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in one um, false belief story, mm -hmm. A character named Sally put her ball in the basket and left the room. Anne came into the room, moved the ball from the basket to the box and left the room. Um, and the question for our subjects is where does Sally think her ball is? Um, meanwhile, in the false photo version of the story, the question is where is um, an object in an outdated mm -hmm. uh, photo? And so for this contrast, we typically see a consistent network of brain regions um, including, um, as Muki again anticipated, the bilateral temporoparietal junction um, or the uh, right um, and left TPJ, um, the precuneus or PC, and the uh, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex or DMPFC. And so these are the um, brain regions that are recruited more for processing information about mental states, again, like false beliefs versus physical states like outdated maps or photos. And they make up what we call this mentalizing or theory of mind um, brain network. Mm -hmm. Um, so once we identify uh, these regions, we can then examine how they are recruited, how they're activated um, for cooperation and competition, and also whether these regions encode um, information that distinguishes between these fundamental social contexts. Um, so the next two studies I'll tell you about are work by my former uh, grad student, Lily Choi, um, who's a postdoc with uh, Diana Tamir at Princeton and also interviewing for um, faculty positions right now, which is very exciting. Um, so we scanned subjects as they played a novel um, dietic game modeled after rock, paper, scissors. Um, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the point of rock, paper, scissors is to predict what the other person will choose and then to make your own choice accordingly in a strictly competitive fashion. Um, our game of shapes included um, competitive and cooperative trials, monetary incentives across all trials and the choice of um, shapes. Um, so players were given a choice of a circle or a square and they were instructed to match or mismatch the other player. 
Uh, and we operationalize uh, cooperation and competition in terms of players' goals and rewards, as I'll show you next. So on uh, cooperative trials, both players have the same goal, both players have to match or both players have to mismatch. If they achieve their shared goal, they both win a dollar on that trial. On competitive trials, players have opposing goals. Um, so if one player has to match, the other player has to mismatch and only one player can win um, on that round in a zero sum fashion. So if I were um, a subject, I might first see, um, I can't tell if you can see the highlighted green mm -hmm. uh, cooperate screen, but I might see a, a cooperate screen telling me the trial type to cooperate. Um, and here go our goal is to um, match each other. So imagine Mookie um, is the person that I'm playing in this game. I see mm -hmm. that my goal is to match Mookie, Mookie's goal is to match me. Um, so if I predict um, Mookie is go going to choose square, then I will also <laughs> choose square so that then we can match each other and win a dollar on that trial. Um, on competitive trials, my goal mm -hmm. will be different from uh, Mookie's goal. So if my goal is to mismatch him, his goal is to match me. Um, so here, um, it looks like I predicted that Mookie would choose circle. I wanted to mismatch him, so I chose square. Mm -hmm. But Mookie chose square, and his goal was to match me. Um, so he would win a um, dollar on that on that trial. Um, so what I'm showing you here are what we're calling the active uh, trials, the active interactions where players' outcomes are uh, determined by their active choices in this uh, shapes game. Um, on passive trials, players were still either pitted against each other or aligned um, in terms of their goals and rewards. So the goal and payoff structures of the game uh, are the same, but this time outcomes are determined by the computer. So there's no need to predict what the other player is going to choose. Um, mm -hmm. As some of you might have guessed, in fact, all outcomes across both kinds of trial types are, are in fact determined by the computer. Um, so when right. subjects come into the scan session, they meet um, a confederate who is gender matched during the consenting process. They think that they're going to be playing this other person mm -hmm. in the game, um, but we fix the earnings such that subjects would win on exactly half the trials. And mm -hmm. I'll note that Lily also ran uh, a purely behavioral version of this task outside of the scanner where both players were in fact actual subjects to ensure that their response patterns looked approximately um, uh, the same when the outcomes weren't fixed, which they did. Mm -hmm. So um, first and unsurprisingly, we see that theory of mind regions were recruited more for the active interactions and the passive interactions. And what I'm showing you here in this picture um, is overlap in the, in the whole brain between the theory of mind um, localizer contrast, that's regions recruited more for false beliefs over regions mm -hmm. recruited for false photos um, and the active versus passive contrast. Um, so what this boils down to is that subjects are more motivated to consider what the other player is thinking when they need to predict what that other player is going to do, which makes sense um, mm -hmm. in the context of this task. Um, second, theory of mind regions were recruited uh, similarly for cooperation and competition. and competition. Here I'm showing you mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. line graphs for the um, active trials, but the same was also true of the, of the passive trials as well. And the takeaway here is that theory of mind is uh, required for action um, prediction across both of these contexts. But so cooperation for, and competition, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. That's right. So we see that... Um, both of these contexts require people to think about other people's mental states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, third, we wanna ask, um, even though we see similar overall levels of activation, um, is there any sense in which these regions can encode the difference between these mm -hmm. um, fundamental social contexts? Um, can they encode um, information that separates these contexts? So here we used um, a technique to analyze the imaging data called multivoxel pattern analysis or MVPA to examine um, whether the spatial patterns of activity for cooperative and competitive trials were reliably distinct from each other um, mm -hmm. in theory of mind regions. So as I said before, instead of averaging over all of the um, voxels within a given brain region to look at the overall pattern or the overall mm -hmm. magnitude, of the of the brain signal as shown in in the line graphs here we looked at the spatial pattern of voxel wise activity within each of these regions and asked can these spatial patterns of voxels be classified above chance as belonging to either one condition over the other mm -hmm. okay so for passive trials classification accuracy was at chance and all for uh, theory of mind ROIs. That means that the spatial patterns looked no different for uh, cooperative and competitive trials. Um, but for active trials, we found above chance discrimination across mm -hmm. um, these regions um, within this network. So in other words, these regions um, across the board seem to encode information that separates active cooperation from active competition. competition. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so again, uh, we see that theory of mind is uh, deployed similarly robustly um, as in those um, line plots um, for action prediction in cooperative and competitive contexts. But in the bar graph, we see that um, they're encoding some information that separates these contexts. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, um, actual incentivized interactions are especially salient. They might have provided us with a good opportunity to detect any difference uh, between these social contexts. Um, but on the other hand, subjects are interacting with the same person across many trials of the same task predicting the same thing. Um, what shape is my partner going to choose? So this could have been a fairly conservative test of the difference between uh, cooperation uh, and competition. So um, Lily ran a, a follow-up experiment, which was different in a number of ways. Um, in this experiment, subjects read about different mm. harmful and helpful agents from a third person perspective. Um, and we can again ask, do we see differences in the overall level of theory of mind? And also, do we still see that same um, neural pattern discrimination? And if so, can mm. that shed light on the, the nature of the information that separates the conditions in the shapes task, cooperation mm. and competition? Mm -hmm. Um, so remember um, the task for localizing brain regions for theory of mind here um, in these pictures note that Anne um, is a relatively neutral moral agent um, in shape of in, in spite of the shape of her eyebrows. Um, <laughs> but suppose that um, Anne had an explicitly uh, harmful intent. Anne Malicious. Mm -hmm. trick, yeah, on Sally by moving the ball. Um, or let's say she had a helpful intent and wanted to help Sally by putting the ball in, in the right place. Mm -hmm. So again, we can ask our brain regions for theory of mind included more for mean Anne or nice Anne. And also, again, can these brain regions tell the difference um, mm -hmm. between these cases? Um, and here we also included a neutral condition as well. Um, so subjects read 30 stories like this one here. I'll, I'll show you just one more to give you a sense of the, the space of our stimuli beyond this classic Sally Ann story. Um, so here, Roxanne went to bed leaving an unfinished puzzle in the living room so that she could solve it the next day. Uh, Max saw the puzzle and solved it that night. Max wanted to show Roxanne that he beat her to mm. solve the puzzle. Max wanted to help Roxanne solve the puzzle. And then in the neutral case, Max wanted to uh, finish the puzzle even if it took the whole night. Mm -hmm. um, so notably, as you can see, this um, true false question that subjects are answering is exactly the same across all three um, conditions of the task. Participants are tasked with predicting um, the character's mental state. What will the character think at the end? Mm -hmm. Um, so interestingly, brain regions for a theory of mind um, are recruited more robustly for harmful versus helpful agents in contrast to the general pattern that we found in the shapes task. Mm -hmm. um, and when the critical mental state information is um, mm -hmm. presented, um, for the most part, these regions, again, um, discriminate between harmful and helpful conditions of this mm -hmm. task in their spatial pattern of activity, again, using that same MVPA, a multivoxel pattern analysis approach that we used in the previous um, shapes experiment. So again, in, in the previous experiment, we saw the theory of mind regions encode um, information separating cooperation and competition. And this uh, new vignette-based experiment provides more mm -hmm. direct evidence that the relevant difference may be between competitive and cooperative intent um, or helpful and harmful intent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we've also looked back at some of our older experiments um, focused on moral scenarios as well. And we see a similar um, pattern, but, but in a different context comparing uh, harmful intent in the case of intentional harm um, with neutral intent in the case of accidents. Um, so again, using MVPA, we find the same um, pattern of neural um, discrimination between harmful and neutral intent um, in the uh, mm -hmm. RTBJ, that right temporal parietal junction uh, region. Um, and importantly, the extent to which this brain region um, discriminates in its spatial patterns between harmful and neutral intent um, correlates with the extent to which um, people do so um, mm -hmm. in their in their behavioral responses, in their moral judgment. So if you're a subject who sees a very big difference between intentional and accidental harms, um, your RTPJ also sees a big difference in its spatial patterns of, of activity. Mm -hmm. So now we've seen uh, three instances in which um, brain regions for a theory of mind discriminate between cooperative or helpful intent and competitive uh, or harmful intent revealing a key feature or dimension of mental state representation. Um, and, a, and a crucial function of theory of mind may be for detecting uh, friend and foe. The way that we're able to tell friend from foe is via theory of mind examining agents uh, intentions and motives, whether we're interacting with them um, directly or ourselves as in, as in the case of the shapes task, 
um, or observing them or reading about them, um, as in the case of the uh, vignette-based experiment. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I've um, noted here that I should, I should stop and see whether anyone has any questions before I move on to the second part of the talk. Yeah, we'll leave the space open for questions. It looks like there hasn't been any that has come so far. But Leanne, is it OK if I riff off and just kind of sure. think through some of the applications of this? Yeah. Yeah, this has me wondering too, right? If uh, one, the cooperation and competition, it seems to, as you noted, robustly recruit theory of mind re regions. But it does seem to be some discernible difference in how we're mentalizing cooperation versus competition. Uh, this has me even think on in terms of clinical practice, how even the practice of reframing uh, yeah. things in terms of therapy, right? Whether it's kind of couples therapy or conflict resolution, how possibly reframing it from a competitive yeah. scenario to a cooperative scenario still allows for a sense of mentalizing on either way, but you know, hopefully uh, changes some of the affect as well. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting, Muki. I had never thought about taking the same two people or the same interaction context and either framing it as either competitive or, or cooperative. Um, but I know that there are um, cases um, within social psychology um, that, are, are there, that are related to that very question. Um, it'd be interesting to see whether um, the neural signatures show up in the same way as well. Yeah, and you know, this is probably a, a question for another time, but yeah, I wonder if there are ways to implement, you know, therapeutic methods while at the same time, you know, uh, the fMRI machines are probably a little too noisy uh, to <laughs> implement things like that, but yeah. yes. And then the, on, on the second point in terms of uh, friend or foe and the discernible differences there, I do wonder too if some of the ways that, um, right, because intent is kind of dubious in our ability to have to perceive and then to mentalize the person's intent. I do wonder sometimes, especially on the societal level, in terms of the things that we've been seeing, in terms of prejudice, right? I wonder if sometimes, right, the intent of being placed in kind of that color our perceptions of a given action also drives some of the ways that we interpret a behavior and then uh, kind of automatically associate friend or foe, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the tricky thing about intentions is that they're often unobservable. Um, and even when they're explicitly provided um, by the agent, um, you might have reason to disbelieve mm -hmm. what they're telling you. And so I think it really goes both ways. You can sort of interpret somebody's intentions based on, you know, preconceived notions or prior impressions, um, even as, you know, information about intentions will influence your judgments of our particular actions. Um, so I think it's definitely... Um, complicated, but I think intentions really play um, Neutral. an interesting role in moral judgment and communication and um, interpretation of um, news and current events and, and all of that. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like uh, our questions are still a little quiet. So yes, feel Great. free to continue yeah. sharing your wisdom. Great. Okay, so as we saw in the first experiment in the shapes task, the same individual can switch between um, being a competitive and a cooperative partner, which may be the case in many of our close relationships too, as, as Muki pointed out mm -hmm. in the case of therapy, um, in, the, in the same context. Um, and as we know from our own experience, people can change, um, and maybe more importantly, we can change our minds about people. Um, so next we'll turn to this key question of how do we update our models of agents, especially when they surprise us, um, and critically, we'll look at whether this updating um, process is different across different social contexts, um, starting with uh, harmful and helpful agents. So um, again, we'll focus on these um, brain regions for, for theory of mind or mental state inference that we saw um, recruited for action prediction in the context of social interaction and moral judgment. Do these regions also um, support the processing of um, surprise or prediction error uh, for moral updating? Um, so when an initially helpful or trustworthy um, individual later behaves in an unhelpful or untrustworthy uh, way, how will these regions respond to that error in the predictions that people make mm -hmm. about that agent? Um, and how might mental state inference or, or theory of mind close that gap between what we expect and what we end up observing? 
So this next experiment is work by my current uh, fourth year grad student, um, Min Jae Kim, who works closely with Mookie as well. Um, here we presented participants with fictional characters um, described as performing some set of um, positive behaviors followed by negative behaviors um, or vice versa in um, a moral updating paradigm. Um, the initial behaviors were intended to build up uh, a prior um, impression or prior belief, either positive or negative about the agent. And the switch in valence was intended to produce what we're calling um, uh, prediction error, or PE, that gap between expectation and observation. So we presented subjects with uh, targets and their photographs paired with sequence of, sequences of behavior. So for instance, uh, Amy here um, worked in a campaign to release prisoners of war. Amy helped push someone's car out of a snowbank. Amy stayed late to help a coworker with an important project. Amy looked after her brother all day as he recovered from a bad cold. Amy stole money from a tip jar at a coffee shop and Amy abandoned her partner during hard times. So with each um, behavior, subjects made a judgment about how trustworthy they found the target given all the information available up to that point. So in this example, we expected subjects would form a, a relatively strong prior uh, impression of the target, specifically, uh, again, this positive impression based on for positive behaviors before having to update that impression based on two opposite valence negative behaviors presented after that switch point. Um, so this is what we're calling the, the strong um, prior positive to negative condition. Um, in the week prior positive to negative condition, we presented only two uh, positive behavior, behaviors prior to the negative update, followed by two neutral behaviors. In the uh, week prior um, negative to positive condition, subjects first formed a weak uh, negative impression before the positive update. And then in a fourth condition, subjects first formed a strong negative impression before the, the positive update. And these four conditions that I've described so far made up 80% um, of the trials. Um, in the remaining 20%, we presented um, six same valence behaviors, negative on this slide here, positive on this slide here. Um, and in these control conditions, the final information was um, expected rather than unexpected. Um, so in a given trial, again, subjects first saw that photograph of the target followed by the first behavior paired with a question about the target's trustworthiness followed by behavior two, all the way up through behavior six. Um, and this is the timing of the trial components in the scanner. Um, so here are the six conditions again. Um, so first, negative updating following a weak positive prior, negative updating following a strong positive prior, positive updating following a weak uh, negative prior, positive updating following um, a strong negative prior, positive control, and negative control. Um, and we also uh, controlled for a number of features across um, valence strength and switch point. So um, moral relevance, emotional valence, arousal, perceived frequency of um, that action, trustworthiness, and intelligence. Um, so our primary analyses rely on um, a measure of updating intended to capture this change in both behavioral responses and also neural responses in the theory of my network um, happening around that switch point. So to do this, we took the uh, average of people's responses to the two behaviors um, post-switch and subtracted the average of the responses to the two behaviors pre-switch um, for all four of our conditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I'll just walk through a quick example of calculating this updating metric since it's it's key to understanding um, both the behavioral and the neural results. So um, on, it, on this particular trial, you might first read um, that Thomas um, had all of his uh, wedding gifts be donations to charity. Mm -hmm. um, you might read him a six on that seven point scale. Then you might read that he spent a morning volunteering at a nursing home um, and rate him a seven. Um, if then you read at the switch point that he lied to his wife about his location when visiting an ex, um, you might rate him a two. Um, and then finally, if you um, read that he ordered his housekeeper around in a harsh tone, you might bump him down to um, a one. And we'll just skip those two neutral behaviors at the end here. Um, yeah. So to calculate- Thomas is not looking good. Yeah, right, exactly. That's, that's the idea. So you take the average of those two post-switch uh, ratings and subtract the average of the two pre-switch ratings, which would be negative uh, five. Um, okay, so on to the behavioral data uh, first. So um, you might note that all those um, numbers are um, positive because we multiplied um, the negative updates as we saw on the previous slide by negative one. Um, we did this instead of taking the absolute values to avoid overestimating the update magnitude in case participants updated um, in the wrong direction on some trials. Um, and what we see here is an effect of um, update direction such that subjects engage in more 
um, negative updating circled in red than positive updating. Mm -hmm. um, and unsurprisingly, subjects also update more um, in all four of those um, expectation violation or surprising uh, valence switch conditions compared to the two control conditions at the end of the graph. Um, we don't see an effect of prior strength in, in, in these behavioral data. There are other hints of, of that in these data, but um, what I think is more convincing is a well-powered conceptual replication of um, the behavioral task, which we ran online on 400 um, MTurk participants, um, where we presented the same sequences um, of, of behaviors as seen in the scanner and found the same um, effect of update direction, but also this time an effect of um, prior strength um, as well. So greater negative updating versus positive updating, and this time greater um, updating of weak beliefs or weak priors versus um, strong priors. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we'll go on to the um, neural uh, data. So what do we see in the neural network for theory of mind? So first you can see that um, all four uh, theory of mind ROI show greater activity in response to post-switch versus pre-switch behaviors. Um, that is, these regions all respond to the uh, switch in the valence or prediction error, that gap, again, between expectation and observation. Um, and this overall um, response to prediction error in the theory of my network aligns well with other work in social neuroscience. I'll just briefly um, highlight a paper by my former grad student, Jordan uh, Chariot, who's now postdoc at Northeastern with Lisa Feldman Barrett, um, for the um, unique item analysis approach that he uses. So in Jordan's work, um, less predictable, less fact-like um, uh, statements mm -hmm. elicit more activity in theory of mind uh, regions mm -hmm. and more predictable items elicit less activity. So the more unexpected um, moral statements, moral propositions were the more activity they elicited in this network. Mm -hmm. um, and in a different project, um, we've manipulated whether information about an agent's um, behavior or mental states is unexpected um, or expected based on the agent's past behavior or past mental states. Um, and in a nutshell, we found that more unexpected behaviors and mental states um, elicited more activity in the same network as well. Mm -hmm. um, now in Minjay's experiment here, um, the overall prediction error effect actually looks different um, across different conditions of this task and also different brain regions. So I'll turn first to the um, DMPFC and uh, LTPJ. So mirroring the effect of uh, update direction in the behavioral data, we see an effect of update direction in both of these regions as well. That is a greater change in activity in the positive to negative direction circled in red than the negative to positive direction. So these regions are recruited more for processing um, surprising negative information than surprising mm -hmm. positive information. Mm -hmm. um, unlike the LTPJ, uh, DMPFC also shows an effect of prior strength. So greater change in activity in mm -hmm. response to um, violations of strong priors versus weak priors marked mm -hmm. by those yellow mm -hmm. stars. Um, and RTBJ also shows the same effect of uh, prior strength. Um, and again, these patterns are broadly consistent with other work showing that within this network, these regions are robustly recruited for encoding social prediction error when mm -hmm. we get people wrong, um, responding more to socially um, unpredicted versus predicted events. Um, and these results in, in our work suggest that these regions are additionally sensitive to the degree of unpredictedness. Um, and then finally, we see no effects of either um, prior strength or update direction in, in precuneous. In the precuneous region, yeah. And it seems like some questions are coming in. So did you wanna kind of finish this section first, Leanne, or did you wanna take some of these questions? Um, I'm happy to... I'm happy to yeah. take some questions now. Yeah, sure. Sure, I can voice it. So yeah, it seems uh, Sheldon's asking, it seems as though uh, it takes quote unquote more brain regions uh, to be recruited uh, to engage in morally objectionable behavior than to do so otherwise, is that correct? And maybe one way to interpret this is I'm wondering if that means the perception of morally objectionable behavior, but maybe over here we're finding that it is the surprising behavior, correct? Yeah, no, that's that's a really great question um, and, and one that we're still exploring actively. So I think that um, what we're finding here is that these regions which are recruited for thinking about mental states are often recruited for morally objectionable behavior because morally objectionable behavior elicits questions about what people are thinking and what people are intending and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, but we're also finding that in some set of these regions, um, we're seeing more activity for um, just information that is more surprising versus 
versus less surprising, um, independent of sort of the moral status of that information. And so um, while it's the case that often morally bad behavior is surprising because there are social norms and moral norms against bad behavior, um, mm -hmm. people can also violate your expectations of them specifically. And we're also seeing that um, these regions are recruited for answering those kinds of questions. Why, you know, why did my mm -hmm. friend do this? Um, uh, and you could also imagine it going the other way around too. So someone could behave surprisingly well, and we would expect to see the same pattern there too, which we do. 100%. Thanks for that, Leanne. And we have one more from Claire. Uh, this question is more in line in terms of both kind of developmental psych, but also clinical psych. Um, and I guess maybe it's more from using. Um, yeah, Claire notes that moral updating makes me kind of think about attachment styles. Uh, and she says it would be interesting to either take an account of the, or history of the subject's kind of attachment. And yeah, do you think perhaps that this would have links to their ability to kind of update robustly in terms of uh, these surprising events? Slash, yeah, have you heard of work kind of in the developmental field in terms of children's uh, updating of these kind of surprising behaviors? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so my background is not developmental psychology, but my grad student Minjay is um, currently collecting developmental data, as, as Mookie knows, on, on a version of this paradigm, a kid-friendly version of this paradigm to look at kids' moral updating patterns. I don't know that we're collecting information on um, attachment on those children or like what developmental window um, that would be most appropriate to do. Um, so we haven't approached this question from a developmental angle. Um, if I have time to get to the next part of the talk, we'll be looking at um, how updating uh, operates in the context of close relationships. And so that might um, bear um, some semblance to, to attachment, although in a very different context. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah, great. Um, all right. So to summarize uh, what I've just shown you, um, DMPFC and RTBJ are sensitive to violations of strong versus weak prior beliefs, independent of the, the valence of the impression, while DMPFC and LTBJ track, again, the direction of the um, impression change from good to bad versus bad to good. Um, now, could it be the case that surprising bad behaviors are also just more surprising than surprising positive behaviors? I think this relates <laughs> well to that first question from Sheldon. Um, so after the scan session, um, we had participants rate post-switch information on its surprisingness. Um, so as expected, people thought that the surprising information was more surprising, that is information violating strong priors versus weak priors. Um, but they rated the violations of the positive and negative priors as similarly um, surprising. So together these, mm. um, patterns of results suggest distinct roles for distinct regions in this network in tracking separate qualities of surprising social information, both the change in the valence and also the degree of surprisingness. Um, mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, exploring um, these effects and, and our interpretation of them, of them is very much a work in progress, but um, here is some initial uh, speculation. So we see that surprising negative behaviors um, drive both greater theory of mind and greater, greater behavioral updating compared to surprising positive behaviors. Mm -hmm. Um, one possibility is that surprising negative behaviors afford easier reinterpretation of earlier positive behaviors. It might be mm -hmm. easier to generate, say, reputation-based explanations for someone's past positive behavior. They must have just done that to look good um, mm -hmm. versus pro-social explanations of past um, immoral acts. Mm -hmm. um, another possibility is that bad behaviors might be um, perceived as affording more robust inferences about intentions and good behaviors consistent with some other um, past behavioral work. So both of these possibilities would be consistent with the, the patterns that we're finding here, both in behavior and in the brain. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, um, violations of strong priors elicit greater theory of mind and strong priors are also resistant to updating. We don't want to change our minds when we have our minds fixed about something. <laughs> um, and so one possibility is that strong priors lead participants to generate alternative explanations for surprising or prior inconsistent behavior. So again, take that example of your friend taking money from the tip jar. If you know your friend very, very well um, and you have strong evidence for your friend's good moral character, then you also have reason to come up with a different explanation for your friend's out of character um, behavior. Mm -hmm. We have some pilot data suggesting that subjects do generate more situation-based versus character disposition-based 
um, attributions for behaviors that are inconsistent with their strong um, prior beliefs. And those attributions also correlate with um, their degree of trust updates. Um, mm -hmm. So um, in concrete terms, the more people attribute an agent's unexpected behavior to the situation, the less they update their impression of, of the agent's moral character. Um, and so these alternative or, or what we're calling these auxiliary explanations for surprising um, information can account for both more theory of mind related activity, more mental state inference, and also less updating when those um, strong beliefs are violated. Um, so it's useful to remember that in um, Minjay's paradigm here, participants are reading about hy hypothetical fictional targets with whom they don't have any relationship. They're not interacting with friends or family, um, but in real life, the strength of our prior knowledge often co-occurs with social motivation. Um, not only do we um, know more about the people that we're close with um, and have stronger evidence for their good moral character, but we also like them more, we're more motivated um, mm -hmm. to maintain our uh, positive impressions of them. Um, and so that makes it really hard to tell whether any instance of belief maintenance is either motivated or procedurally uh, rational. Um, mm -hmm. By contrast, it's easier to make that inference in the, in the current work that strong priors elicit rational belief maintenance via generation of alternative explanations since social motivation is absent. You don't need to protect these fictional hypothetical characters. Mm -hmm. um, and other work um, also suggests that when close others behave badly, people simply ignore or discount that new information for the sake of maintaining their um, impressions, disengaging from these processes altogether. Um, and so surprising information like a friend behaving badly, that friend taking money from a tip jar could actually lead to even less um, activity in this, in this brain network and less um, mm -hmm. behavioral updating as well. Um, and still other work suggests that um, mentalizing mental state inference may be especially important for overcoming um, or updating strong positive priors about close others. That is people successfully update their impressions of people they know and like only by recruiting these um, uh, cognitive capacities for theory of mind. And that's where we'll, we'll turn next. So this is a figure from Minjay's new um, theory paper that walks out some of this logic. Um, so the proposal is that the presence of um, mentalizing or theory mind related activity can help uh, diagnose different paths from prior inconsistent evidence to either uh, rational um, belief updating, rational belief maintenance, or non-rational belief maintenance. Um, so in blue is the space that we've been occupying. Um, again, procedurally rational belief updating um, and rational belief maintenance in the case of these zero acquaintance fictional hypothetical targets. Um, and the space in red is where we're headed next. So we've been looking at um, prediction error and updating in the case of these hypothetical agents, but an outstanding question is what happens when um, people interact with real people, including people uh, again, that they know and like. So I started the talk by referencing in-group bias um, in motivating this broad question of how we deploy theory by and across group boundaries, social context more generally. And I'll circle back to this question now and asking what happens when a friend behaves in a surprisingly selfish way um, versus when a stranger behaves in, in the same way. What do we see for prediction error, uh, theory mind and, and moral updating across these different social contexts? So this next study is work by my former postdoc Bo Kang Park, who's now an assistant professor um, at UT Dallas. So here we recruited um, participants to bring a uh, close gender match friend with them to the scanner. At the scanner, they also met a stranger, uh, another confederate. Um, participants were told that they'd be playing a game um, in the scanner with their friend and the stranger. They were told that on any given trial, um, they would be playing either the friend or the stranger in, um, in a two-player modified dictator game for folks who are familiar with um, economic game terminology, um, but I'll tell you the instructions that we gave to the subject. So. Um, at the beginning of each trial, um, both players receive $20. One player, the friend or the stranger, depending on the trial, can freely um, give money to or take money away from the subject in $5 increments from zero to 20. Um, participants were also told that one of those trials would be um, chosen at random and they would get the um, money earned on that trial as, as bonus payment. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, subjects viewed pre-programmed uh, responses on all trials and the net amount given or taken um, in each run was zero. Um, and on every trial, um, participants rated the extent to which the giver or the taker was trustworthy and also how close they felt to them. Mm -hmm. um, so first and unsurprisingly, we found that subjects rated their friends in green um, more positively than um, strangers in red and giving on the right more uh, positively than taking on the left. 
Um, and critically in the graph in the bottom, we also found that subjects updated less overall trial by trial for friends, again in green than strangers in red across conditions. Um, second, we found that this behavioral pattern is again mirrored by activity um, in the RTPJ across conditions. So less uh, behavioral updating and less RTPJ activity for friend in green than stranger in red, especially for taking uh, people mm -hmm. taking money from you um, on the left. When we zoom in on the friend taking condition, we see less RTPJ is activities associated with more positive ratings of the friend and more RTPJ activity is associated with more negative ratings of the friend, again, suggesting that you really need to recruit your theory of mind capacities um, as supported by RTPJ in order to overcome your bias um, in favor of your friend to rate them badly. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over um, this modeling uh, bit. Um, since I think, Muki, we only have eight minutes left, right, in mm -hmm. this session. All right. Um, but what I will say, um, again, is that um, when participants are able to um, overcome that bias, overcome their resistance to updating their impressions of their friend, they are drawing on those same neural resources, again, located mm -hmm. in QJ and some of these other regions in the theory of my network um, to be able to engage um, and an update um, in a negative direction, um, their impressions of their friends taking money from them in the context of this task. Right. All right, so um, a question that remains that was sort of left open in the last study also is whether reduced updating for um, friends versus strangers is um, procedurally rational given the contribution of people's stronger priors, their greater knowledge about their friends. So in one sense, if you know more about someone, um, it might make rational sense to not throw away that impression in the light of mm -hmm. single interaction in the context of an experimental game. On the other hand, we could have evidence for bias. Um, people may be motivated to maintain their positive impressions of their friends and therefore discount or ignore evidence that suggests otherwise as reflected by um, the fact that subjects are learning less about their friends over the course of the mm -hmm. game. Um, and, and again, like changing their behavior less over the course of the game. Um, so as I said before, this is a question that we are actively exploring, but preliminarily we propose that in this context, to the extent that um, impression maintenance is associated with a reduction, overall reduction in RTPJ activity, which I, I think I showed you at the very beginning, um, we might have evidence for motivated cognition. That is reduced brain activity suggests disengagement from this mentalizing process when friends are behaving badly, um, mm. leading to less updating overall um, for friends. By contrast, in Minjay's um, uh, experiment featuring those hypothetical fictional targets, an increase in mentalizing activity in response to surprising information might signal an effort to generate those alternative auxiliary explanations to make sense of that inconsistent information to come up with a coherent story for how it all fits together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So returning to that tip jar example one last time, if you um, see or hear about your friend taking money from a tip jar, you could conclude that they're a thief, um, or you could <laughs> explain away the evidence um, by concluding that they're making change for a dollar, um, again, robustly recruiting your theory of mind, your mental state, um, inference capacities. Um, or you could turn a blind eye um, to that evidence, right? And well, turning a blind eye to that evidence rather than grappling with it directly and engaging those theory of mind capacities isn't the best path to predictive accuracy, it might have other social relationship benefits. Um, and so Bokyang has evidence of, of those kinds of benefits, namely participants who resist updating their positive impressions of their friends report having more friends. So I'll show you what this looks like here. So in, a, in another study, Bokyang found that um, first, participants who reported um, who updated their friend closeness ratings less negatively compared to stranger closeness ratings reported having more friends. Um, second, Participants who showed reduced um, neural activity when their friend took money from them engaged in less negative updating for friend closeness ratings and stranger closeness ratings. And third, sort of closing the circle, participants who showed reduced neural activity when their friend took money from them also reported having more friends. Um, and so these results suggest that um, in this case, people's biased um, maintenance of their positive impressions of their friends is made possible by, by ignoring rather than explaining their friends' bad behaviors. Um, and may also come with the benefit of thinking that you have more friends. Mm -hmm. um, so returning um, to this logic, maintaining beliefs by discounting evidence and disengaging from mentalizing can lead to maintaining um, 
relationships of some nature, whereas updating um, beliefs and maintaining beliefs via auxiliary generation, generating those alternative explanations um, in blue may lead to having uh, more accurate um, beliefs with good, good predictive power. Um, so normally I would stop again here and, and to see if there are any questions before I move on to the third part, but I might not get to the third part. So maybe I should just stop here and, and, and ask for questions. Yeah, if you want, you could you could take it to the third part if there's an insight there that you wanted to, to share with the folks. I think I can probably summarize the third part in just a couple of sentences or two um, so that we have maybe at least a minute for, for any final thoughts from you, Mookie, yeah. questions from the audience. Um, but that sounds in, good. Yeah, in, in the final part, um, instead, of, instead of looking at how people um, judge close or close versus distant others or update their mm -hmm. judgments of close versus distant others. Um, we look at um, how people judge other people who favor close versus distant others, um, for instance. So sort of this second order judgment. And here we're particularly interested in um, this question of how people perceive favoritism. Um, are there instances in which people think it is good to favor um, close others? Um, and are there other instances in which people think that we ought to be impartial? Um, and the answer is yes. So um, this really cool um, phenomenon that my grad student Ryan McManus has found, and again, I'll just skip through to show you some of these data, um, and you can just ig ignore the graphs for now, but just look at those bullet points. But um, essentially what he finds is that, and you might have this intuition um, yourself, that if you hear about somebody who helps a stranger and you hear about a different person who helps their cousin, you might think that the person who helps a stranger um, deserves more moral credit because they're not obligated to help strangers, whereas people are more obligated to help cousins. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, Ryan finds that people who choose to help the stranger instead of the cousin mm -hmm. and the cousin are worse than people who choose the cousin over the stranger. Um, mm -hmm. So what he finds is that this this interesting pattern of um, judgments is explained by people's intuitions about obligations, familial obligations in these cases. Um, but then he also finds that um, that last set of intuitions switches in cases where agents are thought to have some obligation to be impartial. So if you're a professor in a classroom, you cannot choose to help a family member over um, a stranger um, the way that you could if you're helping a cousin move into their apartment over a stranger who is moving into an apartment. And so um, what these data suggest overall is that our moral judgments in these contexts are incredibly nuanced and sensitive to um, principles of obligation um, in these cases. Yeah. Um, and then I guess I'll just wrap up with this um, final slide with uh, conclusions here. So again, um, we saw that these regions for theory of mind are recruited for both um, competition uh, and cooperation, um, but they also distinguish between these, these social contexts as well based on the moral intent of the agent either toward us or toward others. Um, we can think of this key feature of um, mental state representation as this friend mm -hmm. versus foe dimension. So regions that are for thinking about other thoughts also care about how those thoughts affect us and others. Um, mm -hmm. Importantly, people are also able to update their impressions of agents along this friend or foe dimension in response to prediction errors, surprising information um, indexed by activity in these same brain regions. Mm -hmm. um, we saw that people may be less flexible when it comes to updating impressions of, of close friends, but to the extent that they are able to do so, they rely on the very same brain regions um, that support processing social prediction errors, surprising social information. Um, and then finally, um, I would have shown you, but instead I just summarized for you that people's judgments about others treatment of close versus distant others may be explained by their intuitions about obligation across relational and, and especially familial um, context. So this capacity that we have for theory of mind or mental state mm -hmm. inference might be this multi-purpose tool um, shared and, and conserved across multiple contexts. We have the same neural mechanism or set of neural mechanisms for thinking about others thoughts. Um, distinguishing from friend versus foe um, in the first place, as well as for shifting agents' positions around that space during moral updating in response to social uh, prediction error. So with that, thanks to the wonderful people in my lab, um, including Mookie um, and everyone else on this uh, webinar.
Thank you so much, Leanne. And before, yeah, I give kind of the, the final thanks and then give the mic back to Leanne to just kind of give us a, a final kind of nugget or point of grappling. Yeah, uh, thank you. There's definitely so many questions and insights that I'd love to kind of unpack. Uh, one of the things in the dictums, especially in the psychological humanities and ethics is kind of that uh, invitation to serve the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. And as you kind of noted today here, right, uh, our ability to mentalize uh, things like intent and even, you know, uh, turn maybe a blind eye to our friends stealing from the tip jar, rather than grappling with some of the, the difficulties therein. Yeah, it's, it's kind of part and parcel of, of the human condition. But yes, um, I, it looks like we're definitely uh, out of time for tonight's lecture. Yeah. Um, just to give my gratitude, uh, this event would not have been possible without the work of an entire village and community. So I'd like to thank the Psychological Humanities and Ethics uh, folks, as well as my co-director, Associate Dean uh, David Goodman. Additionally, I'd like to thank all on our team uh, in the Professional and Continuing Education Department at the School of Education and Human Development, including Lillian, Marissa, Caitlin, and many others, and our fearless director, Ashana Hurd, and of course, our colleagues and friends in the Morality Lab. Last but not the least, I'd love to thank Dr. Leanne Young for such a rich and engaging uh, dialogue on moral psychology and inviting us to think a little deeper on how we process what is right and wrong. Leanne, is there any kind of final thoughts or phrase that you'd want people to grapple with as they think more on this question of moral psychology? That's a tall order, but I mean, I think a, a theme running through the studies that I showed you today is how important it is to consider the broader context for people's beliefs and mm. behaviors, including moral updating and, and the moral psycholog psychological processes. So um, whether that context is relationship context or choice context, um, normative context, um, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really critical to sort of keep in mind that, that broader framework when interpreting um, other people's behavior. Thank you so much, Leanne, for that ethical invitation. And thank you all for joining us in this Psychological Humanities and Ethics Lecture. We hope to dialogue with you again in due time.